Welcome to Creation Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle, the president and founder of Creation Training Initiative, where we train others how to speak and teach on biblical creation and apologetics. Well, I have a guest with us today, uh, Michael Ord. And Mike, thank you for coming and hey, spending welcome. some time with us. Now, I'd like to get, let the audience know a little bit about your background. You seem to know a little bit about science. <laughs> well, yeah, I have a master's degree in atmospheric science, which is actually a uh, branch of physics, fluid dynamics. And I also understand you are a weatherman? Yes, I decided to get out of atmospheric research. I uh, got tired of debugging computer programs and decided to get some practical experience in the weather service. So I was a weather forecaster for 30 years. Now, the, the, how often were you correct? Uh, depends on how <laughs> fine of a scale you are judging. <laughs> okay. How often did you get caught saying it's not going to rain today and it rained? <laughs> oh, uh, quite often. Okay. So, so now we know everything we need to know about you. Your credibility is about there with being a weatherman. <laughs> no, no. But uh, you've done many other things. Uh, you do, do a lot of geological research today. Uh, yes, I realized about 40 years ago that we needed help uh, in geology. So I've been doing uh, geological research, uh, starting with literature research, but about 30 years ago, a lot of field research uh, uh, in geology. And in the meantime, I learned a lot of geophysics and glaciology. And you've, you've written books about the weather? You've, uh, yes, the weather. Fact, we have that book on weather, and you've written many other books on the woolly mammoths and, and uh, ice age. Yes. And that brings up a topic right there, ice age. What is an ice age? People seem to talk about these things, of global warming, ice age. What is an ice age? Well, an ice age is essentially a great increase in snow and ice. It's okay. Not too difficult. I, I like people who make it easy. Yeah. Right now, 10% of the continents have ice and snow on them, mainly Antarctica and Greenland. During the ice age, 30% of the land surface was covered by snow and ice. Only 30%? Only 30%, and mainly in the high and mid-latitudes. It didn't cover and tropical mounts at high altitude. But other than that, uh, it didn't cover, you know, low altitudes and, and, and low latitudes. So there really was an ice age? Uh, yes, there was, because if you want to find out uh, whether there was an ice age, you go to places currently glaciated and look what glaciers produce. And they produce a jumble up of rocks. Uh, they produce uh, lateral moraines on the sides of a glacier and end moraines in front of it. And they're kind of ridges of debris where they push it out and it melts and leaves a ridge. And then it scratches bedrock. Okay. And the rocks at the base of the glacier, as they scrape against the bedrock, scratching it, they get scratched. And sometimes those rocks being in ice, they can turn and get scratched in different directions. So you get different sets on the rocks and the debris in the rocks, but the bedrock usually has one direction. And so with these signs we see from present uh, glaciated areas, we can go to a lot of other areas and presto, dis the discovery, we find out that we, we have these in a lot of areas that right now are so hot in the summertime, no gl gl glaciers are foreign there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so it's um, like you have to cool the area off 50 degrees Fahrenheit, at least in the summertime. So th the big picture is that we had an ice sheet over most of Canada and then in the northern United States. Uh, how far south, I'm not really sure. But I know up in Montana, where I'm from, it's in the very northern part, and it was in some of the valleys of uh, northern Idaho mm -hmm. and in uh, northern Washington, down into Puget Sound area, mm -hmm. down to Olympia. So we, we know uh, approximate boundaries of, of the ice sheet in, in so, North America. So it didn't cover places like California and, and maybe New Mexico and Arizona? Except in the mountains. It didn't cover the low areas. The Sierra uh, Nevada mountains were well glaciated. Okay. And even in Arizona, the San Francisco mountains were glaciated at the very top. Otherwise, the lower areas were not glaciated. Now, I've heard some differences on this ice age from whether you believe in evolution or your creation. Do evolutionists have a good explanation for what could cause and sustain an ice age? I always put those two together. They have to cause it and sustain it. No, they don't. Uh, see, they depend on present processes to explain all the rocks and, and uh, fossils, but also for climate and climate change in the past. So what kind of present processes? Well, we have the astronomical theory of the Ice Age, which changes the geometry of the Earth's orbit a little bit, causes slight changes in solar radiation. That's the best theory out right now. But other than that, that's a poor theory, as well as all the other 60 theories or more that they've invented over the years. So if it just got real cold for some reason, let me, the Earth moves further away from the sun, it wouldn't be enough cause for an ice age? No, first of all, it wouldn't get real cold. 
And uh, no, it, it wouldn't necessarily cause an ice age because uh, the colder the air, the drier the air. And, and you need moisture for an ice age. Okay. A lot of it. <coughs> besides cooler summers, uh, winters are cold enough right now to, mm -hmm. to, for most areas for an ice age. And <coughs> another controversy is the number of ice ages. How many ice ages have there been? Well, <laughs> that has varied from their idea or model over the years. Uh, when the Ice Age concept first came about, starting in, in 1840, it was a radical challenge to the principle of uniformitarianism because ice sheets aren't in a lot of these areas they claim, uh, I mean, today they're not, uh, that were in the past. So that's against present processes over millions of years. And, but, so it was an assault on uniformitarianism. But then as they started looking at these things, they see complications in the glacial debris that suggested maybe there were more than one. Okay. So after a while they got the, the idea, I think it was more psychological that, well, it doesn't sound so unusual to have many of them repeating. Uh, so if we accept one, let's, you know, there's, it's a, it was a psychological push to have many. And so in complicated areas, they noticed uh, things like uh, glacial debris, then a layer of, say, sand, it might be something else, then glacial debris. And so they automatically got into the mindset of calling that two ice sheets. Okay. So yeah. after a while, um, it grew from to four. It, it, they believed in four. It okay. became a solid, absolute belief for 60 years until it was challenged uh, in the 1960s mm -hmm. and replaced. And now they believe there's about 50 of them in regular succession, repeating every 100,000 years or every 40,000 years in the last 2.6 million years of their time scale. So they keep coming up and telling us this is a fact, that's not true. Then they tell us here's another fact, that's not true. When should we believe them? <laughs> <coughs> well, I think the problems are in the assumptions and we shouldn't believe them at all on, on their okay. model. But we can be believe there was an ice age because the evidence is out there that okay. there was an ice age. Well, if they don't have a good explanation for what could cause and sustain an ice age, now how long were their ice ages? How long did they last? Well, that's, that's a good question. Um, they claim that each ice age takes 100,000 years for the last million years in their time scale. Uh, so does it really take 100,000 years? Actually, I think it would take uh, billions of years for their model mm -hmm. because what, do we, what does it take for an ice age? That's a good question. And now. If they don't have a good model, do creationists have a good model? And let me ask you a double question. Do creationists have a good model? And what could cause and sustain an ice age? Oh, we do, but I need to back up to, to, to mention what causes okay. an ice age. Okay. You've got to get uh, summer cooling of about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Uh, winters are cool enough in most areas for an ice age. Then you had to need a great increase in moisture. So these are the conditions you need. And the question is, can we explain this? See, they have trouble explaining such radical climate change. Talk about your climate change. This is radical, not a few degrees. Okay. But, but not like this, this alleged global warming that's going on. Yeah, that's a whole different story. <laughs> yeah, it's different a different story. story. Okay. <laughs> Weren't we talking about an ice age occurring about 30 years ago? Yes, we had. Uh, that, that's why it's uh, another topic. natural <laughs> process. But I'll quickly address that. Between 1945 and 1975, we had global cooling when the supposed cause of uh, was global warming of CO2 increasing, and so it was, it was their opposite. And, and by the 1970s, it, it cooled 30 years uh, globally on the average, they, and sea ice was increasing, so a lot of people came out and said the next ice age is due. So they thought we're having an, again, I have an ice age in the 1970s. But that didn't happen. No, it didn't. We started uh, the, the warming a bit, and okay. it's global warming. But let's get back to causing and sustaining an ice age. Okay, um, in the, they can't explain it. They have 60 theories, and it's a radical climate change. Can we? Well, we gotta, first of all, place it within our, our time frame. And, and the features that are from the, from, look like from an ice age are on the surface. They're on top of flood uh, uh, sediments, and they have nice sharp moraines and things that cannot form uh, during the flood. So it's, it's pretty straightforward that the ice age was after the flood. Mm -hmm. So we would place it in a transitional climate from the flood to the present uh, climate. So that brings up the possibility that, that maybe the flood, uh, the aftermath of the flood caused the radical climate change for the ice age. 
And indeed, that's what the case is. Now, how could a flood cause an ice age? How, where's the moisture come from? Uh, the moisture comes from the warm oceans. See, the okay. flood was a, a, a gigantic tectonic and volcanic event. Uh, it would add a lot of warm water from below and a lot of volcanism would heat the water. So after the flood, the, the, the ocean water, that's where the flood water is drained and, and now in the present ocean. So the ocean water would be warm from top to bottom and pole to pole. There'd be no sea ice. It may be a 75 degrees Fahrenheit on average, maybe 85. We don't really quite know, but it was pretty warm. The significance of this is the warmer the water, the more the evaporation. And the effect is the strongest at, at mid-high latitudes where sea surface temperatures are cool now. Mm -hmm. and we don't get a lot of evaporation compared to further south where we have warmer water. So if you have warm water at mid and high latitudes, you have much more evaporation than today. That can be fed into storms and then rapidly dumped nearby at mid and high latitudes on the land to cause a rapid ice age. That's something I don't read too much in the evolutionist literature. When I read their stories about an ice age, they talk about getting hotter or colder, but they very seldom mention moisture. Where'd all the moisture come from? They rarely do. They, they've tried it, and, uh, and a few, few people mentioned it, and they do admit that uh, having warmer water and ocean water would help, but, but they can't figure out a mechanism for it to be all that much warmer. So the amount of evaporation from maybe a degree or two warmer seawater is small compared to maybe 20 degrees or 30 degrees Fahrenheit warmer in, say, the Gulf of Alaska. And when we look out there, we see signs of volcanism all over this planet, don't we? So something happened in the past that's not happening today. Yes, the flood was a gigantic volcanic event, among other things happening, yeah. lots of things happening. And you mentioned the tectonic movements. and, and, the, and when, It's like when you rub your finger on a rug. Now, don't do this at home. It, what happens? If the faster you go, the, the warmer it gets, and pretty soon you've got a burn there. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that's friction. That would be these large tectonic plates moving back and forth and causing tremendous well, amount and, of friction. And vertical, and tectonic, vertical. tectonic. So there's lots of ways to heat the uh, uh, flood waters. And as far as uh, you also need cooler temperatures, you, meant, you asked me about that. And um, well, the volcanism also causes that because when volcanoes go off, they add a lot of ash that usually falls out in a week to months. But then they add these aerosols. Uh, uh, sulfur, uh, mm -hmm. sulfur dioxide, and it combines with water forming sulfuric acid, and it's trapped in the stratosphere. And the significance of this, it reflects a lot of the sunlight back to space, so it's not able to come down to the land and be absorbed on the surface. And okay. that causes the cooling. So the Bible has the only real reliable mechanism for causing and sustaining an ice age. Right, through, because of the flood. But they won't teach that, will they? Isn't that incredible? The no. only scientific explanation is in the Bible, and they don't allow it. Yes. That seems to be a trend in our education system to not allow science when it contradicts the philosophy of evolution. Oh, yes, yes. That's called censorship by any other name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, do you think there's a possibility we could have another ice age? Well, uh, no, but uh, they do because we're in this cycle. Remember, mm. they think there's 50 of them in the last, uh, approximately 50, in the last 2.6 million years of their time scale, what they call the Pleistocene or the Quaternary. And so we're, we're in the interglacial now. It's called the Holocene in their jargon. Uh, but, but we're still in the cycle. So we're about ready to descend into a new ice age. They claim that, that interglacials last 10,000 years. The Holocene's been 10,000 years. So we're about due for the ice age uh, part of this. So that's why they, they jumped on it in the, the 70s. So they do believe there will be a future ice age coming up. But we don't believe that because the, the, there was only one flood. The rainbow was a promise. There will never be another flood. And the flood caused the ice age. If, if there's never going to be another flood, there's never going to be another ice age. So there will never be a, f a future ice age. That refutes the whole local flood idea right there, doesn't it? Because if we had a local flood, where would we get an ice age from? That's right. It was a global phenomenon. And, 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 uh, yes, global phenomenon, global ice age. Now, another question. How long did that ice age last? Okay, that's a good question. Um, a major question. Like I said, they, they believe it's 100,000 years. Uh, how would we time it? Well, by the mechanisms that cause it, the, the warm ocean and the volcanism. By the way, the volcanism is reinforced by lots of post-flood volcanism or, or during, during the ice age volcanism. Uh, you had a lot, lot of uh, more than today. That would reinforce the aerosols in the stratosphere. Um, 
So for us, we can time it by the mechanisms that cause it will wane with time. Mm -hmm. And the key factor is the cooling of the oceans. Once it, start, it cools down far enough, the ice age will, will not have enough moisture, not enough fuel to keep it going. And so it's gonna come up, rise to a maximum, and then, it, then it's gonna start melting. And so based on the cooling time of the ocean, uh, I estimated, by the way, there's very, the way I estimate this is there's, uh, there's ways to warm the ocean, mainly solar radiation, mm -hmm. and there's ways to cool the ocean, mainly evaporation is the main mechanism, but there's other variables. So you add up all these and you get a, a change in temperature, change in time. So if you could estimate the, the change in temperature to reach uh, glacial maximum, you solve for a change in time. So I estimated about uh, the ice age would, uh, uh, would stop after the oceans cooled 38 degrees Fahrenheit. And the ice age would have reached a maximum then. And so how long would it take it to fall 38 degrees Fahrenheit? Well, there's no way to be accurate in these, uh, this budget equation. The, the heat inputs subtract the heat outputs. So I use maximum minimums for the variables. And I got it anywhere from as low as about 200 years to as high as 1,800 years. And the best variables uh, was about 500 years to reach glacial maximum. And then you have to estimate how thick were the ice sheets, because then you have to melt them. Mm -hmm. And so based on how much falls on the land versus the oceans and things of this sort, I estimated that in the northern hemisphere, the average depth would be 2,300 feet and over Antarctica, 4,000. And so how long would it take to melt an average of 2,300 feet? By the way, that's a rough average. Some places were a lot thicker. Some places were very thin. I know that from uh, glaciology. But so how long would it take to melt? Well, I used the, the best equation you can for snow melt. It's called the energy balance over a snow or ice cover. And that's the same thing like the cooling of the ocean. You have, you have heat inputs, which is mainly solar radiation. You subtract the heat outputs. Uh, and then you get a change in temperature, change in time. But in this case, once the temperature raises to 32 degrees, then you start getting that melting. And from there, you can calculate uh, how much melting over, over a certain period. And, but there's, but these, this equation, there's no way to be accurate, so I use maximum and minimums again. But I got an average of about 70 years along the edge of the ice sheet, maybe the, the, the first 400 uh, miles of the ice going in towards the interior. That's the edge of the ice, and that melted in about 70 years, which is about 33 feet a year, which is the approximate melting rate in the melting zones of Icelandic, Norwegian, and uh, Scandinavian glaciers right now. So it's a very reasonable calculation. So at 33 feet a year, it, it melts away at about 70 years. But interior Canada, interior Scandinavia, it'd be, uh, you have less solar radiation, cooler temperatures would be slower melting. And so, but you don't add too much more, and that's approximately 200 years to melt. So you have 500 years to build up to maximum, 200 years to melt for a total time of 700 years. So that's amazing. That's a lot different than a 100,000 year period. Oh yeah, and it's an example <laughs> where we use biblical variables, yes. get the raw data. You gotta make sure you get the raw observational data and you use biblical variables and you get a totally different results. And it's matching the observable evidence we have today. Oh yeah. And uh, now those glaciers we see out there now, they're a result still of leftover ice age. Is that true? Uh, some are. Some. Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, Greenland, it looks like uh, based on, on a variable called oxygen isotope ratios, um, looks like about half of it built up during the ice age. And then it continued to build after that. Mm -hmm. Now Antarctica, it looks like most of that built during the ice age. So we've added very little since then. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because the top of the Antarctic ice sheet only gets that much ice and or, or pure a, ice about a year. an inch and a half and the, you know so so Antarctica quit you know it didn't add too much so it's it's making sense that uh, uh, from the ice age point of view now I got to ask you a, a biblical question here I, I read the book of Job I've read it several times mm. and Job talks about a lot of cold coming from the north would that have anything possible to do with the ice age or are we just kind of grasping at straws there well the the, the boundary of the ice was pretty far north but but there were mountain ice caps around. Uh, he might have seen uh, them on Mount Hermon, uh, or, and then maybe other places if he ventured kind of far from the Middle, Middle East, he might have seen it. So some of the, uh, like I said, some of the mountains areas around the area were glaciated at the very top. So he might have seen uh, uh, glaciers, and so, but I can't say for sure that he, 
that it, that it demonstrates an ice age in there. It, it's suggestive. Okay. He talks about cold and frozen uh, lakes and things, so it's suggestive. So to kind of summarize what we've had is the evolutionists have about 60 different models for an ice age, and yes. none of them really work scientifically. No, and I can get lots of quotes where they admit this. Specialists admit this, even though if you go to a, a maybe a, a freshman level course, some of these professors make it sound like get a little cooling presto, we have the ice age, but specialists realize this and, and, and say, and will admit and give uh, that we don't have an ice age theory now. In fact, in, in 1997, U.S. News and World Report had a special issue on the 18 top mysteries. The whole issue was dedicated to 18 top mysteries of science. And one of those 18 was what causes ice ages. It, to, to them, they said ice ages, they believe in multiple ice ages, but what causes them, they did, didn't know. So once know. again, we have another big problem with our public education system, what we see in the textbooks, because they're sitting there teaching ice age and no problem. Yeah, and specialists say that the theories we have now uh, don't work. So the evolution is that none of their models really work. Um, the Bible gives a good answer that could cause and sustain an ice age. And it wasn't hundreds of thousands of years, it's mm -hmm. somewhere around 700 years yes. for the full model. And the flood is the catalyst for all this. It's the important right. issue. So the, what we draw from there, people believing in billions of years, which would relegate to a flood to a local flood, mm -hmm. can't explain the Ice Age either then. No, they can't. So there's a big problem with believing in a local flood. Uh, yes, they a can't worldwide flood is the answer to the geology we have out there today. Mm -hmm. It's an answer to the ice age, the only answer we have for an ice age. So once again, we can turn to the Bible and we can trust it without having to modify it and make it man's wisdom versus God's wisdom. Yes, and I found that out in my research personally. Yes. Now, Mike, I've got to ask you another thing. You've written a lot of books. Yes. And I've got, I think I have all of them, except maybe your, your newest ones. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us some of the names of these books and where people can get these books? Because I think they're exciting books. They're easy to read and understand type books. They're, they're some are right there for the lay person to understand the Ice Age, the mammoths, and all that kind of information. So could you give us some information on the books and where to get them? Okay, my main book is um, a Frozen in Time, The Woolly Mammoths, The Ice Age, and the Biblical Key to Their Secrets. You can you can get Master Books publishes it, but uh, you can get it from Answers in Genesis and and I think all the major creationist organizations uh, carry it. And in there, uh, you not only learn about the Ice Age, but there's a lot of subsidiary mysteries associated with the Ice Age, like the woolly mammoths uh, uh, in Siberia and Alaska, some with uh, their uh, frozen uh, carcasses with food in their stomach and their mouth. So I deal with that issue too. See. See, I've spent 40 years working on this, and so uh, there's lots of aspects, and I, I have written either papers on these or, or put them in book form, and, and that's my major uh, layman-friendly book uh, on the Ice Age, but it's got a bonus on the Woolly Mammoth, the Woolly Mammoth Mystery also. And it's a, it's a paperback book, and it's not hard to read. <clears throat> that's what makes it very nice. It's not hard to read, paperback, and it's not real thick, is it? No, it's about yeah. like that. And that's another <laughs> nice thing about books. I like thin books. So I recommend that book highly to, to understand the Ice Age and woolly mammoths. Now, you've written uh, some other books. Tell us about those. Yes. Uh, see, uh, I want to uh, teach the Ice Age uh, to lots of different audiences. So I had a technical monograph supporting all this stuff out, but it's out of print. Uh, but I have some children's books uh, to teach about the Ice Age in storybook form. Fun stories like uh, Life in the Great Ice Age. It's, it's a, a very well illustrated color pictures uh, uh, teaching about the Ice Age from, from a 12-year-old boy and his, uh, with his dog. He live, and he's living just south of the ice sheet in, in Germany, uh, uh, cent, uh, central Germany approximately. And it's an adventure story of one summer uh, with... Uh, with a group of people that come and meet them, which are Neanderthal people, which are type of people that lived up there during the Ice Age, teaches them about Neanderthals and uh, you know what, how they fit into the biblical worldview of the Ice Age, and it teaches about the Ice Age uh, in storybook form, about the weather changes, the the, the horrible weather, uh, the hunting practices, um, what they did in caves, what they constructed in caves. 
Uh, they hunted woolly mammoths, <laughs> and, and they had to roust out a cave bear from a cave. So my, we, we did this, and at the end we, we explained all this in, in more um, uh, regular language instead of storybook form, what you know, a lot of this meant. So that was Life in the Great Ice Age. Then we published a sequel on this called Uncovering the Mysterious Woolly Mammoth, Life at the End of the Great Ice Age, which focused mainly on the, the mammoths, the extinction of the mammoths, and, and other animals that went extinct too. So these are for young people, ages, uh, grades approximately six on up to adults. And in fact, I've heard many adults get a lot out of them. So. Yes, I learned some things reading them, <clears throat> and I looked at the pictures too. They're <laughs> wonderful illustrations in there. Now, being an atmospheric scientist, you also wrote a book on the weather. Yeah, I just uh, wrote a, a book on just general, general weather, uh, focused on storms. Um, and so that was to teach basic meteorology that's part of the Ice Age. Uh, I would recommend that book for any Christian school that wants to talk, do a char chapter on weather. It's, it's tremendous. You, you really learn about this and you have good illustrations in there also. Yes, and most of the, the creationist organizations carry these books. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they can get it from the Answers in Genesis website or the uh, Institute for Creation Research website. Either place they can get any of these books. Well, I want to thank you an awful lot for coming to straighten them up tremendous challenge out there, the Ice Age. What caused it? Was it really an Ice Age? How long did it last? And who has the best model for what caused and sustained an Ice Age? Thank you very much, Michael Lord, and thank you for all the research you're doing out there and helping Christians like myself and others out there in this next generation understand fully they can stand in the authority of God's Word and they don't need to apologize for it or change it. I want to You're thank welcome. you very, very much, and God bless everyone. If these lessons had been a blessing to you, you might consider financially supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can do this by going to our website, creationtraining.org. Again, that's creationtraining.org. Your tax-deductible donation of just $20, $50 or more a month, or a one-time gift of any amount will make you an education partner in building an army of Christian educators who can teach the biblical account of creation and train others to be able to defend their faith and be biblically faithful to God's word as it states in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear.